The subjects of poverty and inequality are often scrambled together in public discussions, but they aren't at all the same thing. As discussed in the previous lecture, poverty refers to those who are below a certain level of income. Inequality, on the other hand, describes the gap between the poor and the rich. Imagine, for example, that the rich get much richer while the poor get a little richer. Then inequality might go up because the spread between the poor and the rich is rising, but the poverty rate could be going down at the same time. Or imagine that the poor do a little bit worse and the rich do a lot worse. In that situation, Poverty could increase because the poor are doing worse at the same time that inequality, the gap between rich and poor, is falling. And at a fundamental level, we care about poverty and inequality for somewhat different reasons. At a basic level, we care about poverty because some people are being deprived of basic necessities. I would say that we care about inequality for reasons that have more to do with a sense of fairness of opportunity, a sense that it would be a good thing to live in a society where the rewards and the disparities are not just distributed by birth or by luck or by family connections, but they have at least some connection to producing what the rest of society wants. Well, how do we measure inequality? We need some way of capturing the entire distribution of income, not just the low end of it. A standard approach is to split the income distribution into parts, like fifths or tenths or even single percents and then say what share of income is being received by each share of the income distribution. Now for simplicity in this lecture I'll mainly stick with dividing up the income distribution into fifths with some mention of the top five percent. The level of inequality in the US income distribution can be measured by looking at the share of income received by different quintiles or different fifths. If each fifth of the U.S. In income distribution got exactly 20% of total income, then income would be equally distributed. If the bottom 20% got 20% of the income, the middle 20%, the next 20%, the fourth 20%, the top 20%. But in fact, of course, the bottom fifth gets a lot less than 20% of total income, and the top fifth gets a lot more. In fact, starting in the 1970s, there's something of a trend toward those with high incomes having a larger proportion of all total income. Now just to give you some perspective here, uh, the top fifth of all families in the year 2000 started at about $95,000 in total income and went up from there. So today it's probably some number above $100,000, but not necessarily a whole lot above. So let me give you some actual numbers on the income distribution. Um, the, in 2002, the bottom fifth of the income distribution got 4.2% of total income. The second fifth got 9.7% of total income. The middle fifth, the middle quintile of the income distribution, got 15.5% of total income. The fourth fifth got 23% of total income. And the top fifth, the top 20% of the income distribution, got 47.6% of the income. If you look inside that top fifth a little bit, then you just look at the top 5% of the income distribution. In 2002, the top 5% of the income distribution got about 20.8% of the total income in the economy. Over time, that distribution, the spread between the bottom fifth and the top fifth, has actually been rising somewhat over time. For example, if you go back to 1975, the top fifth of the income distribution at that point was getting 40.7% of total income. So it goes from 40.7% of total income, then by 1985 up to 43.1% of total income. By 1995 up to 46.5% of total income. By 2000 up to 47.7% of total income, right about where it was in 2002 after the recession. To put it a little bit differently, the top fifth of the income distribution was getting 40.7% of the income distri distribution back in uh, 1975. And by 2002, it was getting seven percentage points more. It was getting 47.6% of total income by 2002. That's quite a large shift. If you look at a more detailed breakdown, and you particularly focus on that top 5%, 
almost all of that increase going to the top fifth of the income distribution was actually going to the top 5% of the income distribution. And for perspective, the top 5% of all families in the U.S. in 2002 started at about $164,000 and went up from there. So now it's a few years later. I suspect it's some number that's less than $200,000, but maybe not extremely a whole lot less than $200,000 a year. So that's the level of inequality we've got. And we know that the level of inequality as measured by these quintiles has been going up. Is that a bad thing? Well, some degree of inequality is surely understandable. There's absolutely no reason to think that we ought to have an economy where everyone gets exactly the same income all through their life. For example, most people, when you first start out working in your 20s or in your teens, you have a somewhat lower income. Then you build up your income over time in middle age, uh, have high income years in your 40s and 50s. And then when you're elderly and you start going to part-time work or retirement, then you have lower income. There's no reason you should have the same income every year of your life. Even year to year, there are shifts between rich and poor. Uh, people might have an especially good year and especially bad year. In some industries like construction or farming or people who write uh, books or, or record music, they'll have good and bad years. There are also people who make earning money a, a top priority in their life, and others do not. Um, my, there are friends of mine who worked for a time in investment banks in New York City, and I'm thinking particularly of the, the hot, hot go-go days of the late 1990s there. But I remember at least one of them telling me that her standard schedule was that she worked straight through the night a couple times a week. I mean, she would show up in the morning at, you know, Monday morning, and she would go home Tuesday night get a night's sleep, come back Thursday morning and work through the night and leave Friday night. Now, this person made an extremely high income level, much more than my income level, but, but obviously at some cost in terms of time. Uh, she's probably working the equivalent of two jobs in terms of hours. And there are people who work two jobs and there are other people who don't. There are some people who would prefer to have a job where they earn enough money to afford a house and so on, but they would rather you know, stay home and read than buy an expensive vehicle or a boat. There are some people who like to travel cheap, and there are some people who like to travel in luxury hotels. There are some people who want a huge house and car, and there are some people who don't. Uh, to some extent, inequality in incomes is just going to result from these kinds of preferences. So. We know that perfect inequality, just, just uh, perfect equality, just isn't going to be a sensible goal. There's going to be some inequality because people are different. And with all this taken into account, uh, is the level of inequality we have now reasonable or not? Um, perhaps not a big surprise. These are lectures about how to think about things. I'm going to sidestep that question a little bit. Um, a famous economist from the University of Chicago named Henry Simons was talking about inequality, and he wrote back in 1938 that the case against inequality depends on the ethical or aesthetic judgment that the prevailing distribution of wealth and income reveals a degree and or kind of inequality which is distinctly evil or unlovely. That phrase about evil or unlovely and whether it's an aesthetic judgment is something that's echoed down among economists over time. Uh, in fact, I, I find that there's a, a, an almost inability of people on both sides of inequality disputes to even understand the way the other people think. In some cases, some folks are just upset about the level of inequality they see. It just bugs them. It bugs them down to their toes. And if you say, well, it you know, doesn't bother me that much, they think that you're, you're, you're not telling the truth somehow because it's obvious. Isn't it obvious that it's a terrible thing? Isn't it obvious that it ought to bug you? And on the other side, um, there are people who say, well, you know, it doesn't bother me all that much. And they just honestly can't understand why people on the other side get so excited about it. They're like, you know, what, what makes you so excited about the level of inequality that's happening? So I, I think that we need to recognize that people just have different aesthetic judgments there. What about the question of mobility across the income distribution? The income distribution at any given time is a snapshot. It tells you how people are located along the income distribution, but it doesn't tell you about how people are moving toward higher and lower levels.
If there's a lot of movement from lower quintiles to higher quintiles and higher quintiles to lower quintiles, then maybe you worry somewhat less about income distribution because sort of everyone gets their chance at the top, everyone gets their chance at the bottom. Now, to know whether there is movement from people between the quintiles, you need to track the same people over a long period of time. Most government surveys don't do this. They just look at the population, but they don't tell you, did that person go up or down according to where they do last year? However, there is a survey project at the University of Michigan called the Panel Study of Income Dynamics. And starting in 1968, it started tracking a nationally represented group. And it's been tracking those people and their children and their relatives, and it tracks people after they split up after divorce. And so you can actually track people over time and watch people move in and out of different quintiles as they get older, as they move in and out of the workforce, as their life patterns change. Uh, the patterns that you see looking at this PSID data from the University of Michigan are, are pretty much what you might expect. That is, there's a, a fair amount of movement, but it tends to be moving maybe one or two quintiles. People who are at the very bottom of the income distribution move up a little bit, but they don't always move right to the top. And similarly, people at the very top of the income distribution might move down a little bit, but rarely do they fall all the way down to the bottom. But, but here's my key point, really. The amount of mobility between quintiles doesn't seem to have changed much over time. It seems much the same in the 2000s and 1990s as it did in the 1980s and 1970s. So, although we know for sure that the level of inequality has been rising, and we know there's some mobility. We also know that the higher level of inequality is not being counterbalanced by a greater level of mobility. So mobility isn't making us worry less about the rise in inequality than it otherwise would. Indeed, in a world where the, where the skills of labor are especially and increasingly important, the pattern may be that high-income parents have the human and the financial resources to invest in their children in a way that that helps their children to have higher incomes too. In that sense it may be easier than it was in the past to pass a high income to the next generation because of the importance of investing in children as they grow up. There are international comparisons where they look at intergenerational mobility. That is, do children tend to follow the income pattern of their parents? And the answer seems to be, in the last 30 years or so, that the U.S. does not have more intergenerational mobility than most countries of Western Europe. Indeed, there are several studies that suggest that the U.S. has less intergenerational mobility than either Canada or Sweden. So there's less of people moving back and forth across the income distribution than in those other countries. So bottom line, inequality is up, mobility is not up, and if you're worried about inequality, if it's an aesthetic thing that bothers you, there's certainly some reason to be concerned. And I'll dip my toe in the water there and just say that the rise in inequality does bother me. Having some inequality doesn't, but a continual rise does bother me. So, what are the reasons for this rise in inequality? We need to look for reasons that have been more or less continuously happening over the last several decades because the rise in inequality started in the 1970s and has continued for the last 30 years. So it can't be something that just one president did or one law that passed. It has to be a continuous force over time. We also want to look for reasons that might apply internationally because to some extent we've seen an increase in inequality in most of the world's high income economies. And so we want something that goes across international borders. And again, not something that's one law passed by the U.S. Congress or something like that. The single biggest reason for the rise in inequality appears to be the changes in information and communications technology that have been happening over recent decades. Essentially, those changes have complemented or worked with the productivity of high-skilled workers. The way I sort of imagine this in my mind is, sort of imagine that there's a, a level of demand for high-skilled workers and a level of supply for these high-skilled workers. Now, 